quick second. As a specimen paper question, this is two two actually. This is uh, no, this is this is. I said that's twenty two. It's twenty twenty two. Question paper four. Define the term uh, transition metals. So we're going to start with this. Uh, so again, it's all about uh, uh, what is a transition metal? It's a it's a D block element. And what what does that what does that D block element do? It uh, it forms stable ions. So it forms stable ions with incomplete D subshells. So incomplete D subshells. Then it's uh, NSC is a monodentate ligand. What is meant by the monodentate ligand? That it's got it's got exactly uh, only one lone pair. So only one lone pair is involved. Nadine, this is this is uh, the specimen paper for twenty twenty two. Based on the new syllabus, this is the specimen paper. So you've got NSC only one lone pair is involved in forming involved in forming a coordinate bond in a metal complex. In a metal complex. So that's uh, I mean water, NST, etc. They're all monodentate lichens. Silver ions react with ammonia to form a linear complex, suggest so the formula. So this is Tollens reagent in silver ions. If you uh, put it in uh, ammonia, so the silver ions gets surrounded by two NH3s, and uh, the overall thing has a charge of plus one because NH3s. Uh, so basically, this is what happens: the linear linear complex that is formed. I said the linear the linear complex that is formed. A linear complex that has formed is it's got silver ions and there's an ammonia with its lone pairs getting attracted to it from one side. And there's another ammonia with its uh, lone pairs getting attracted or forming a dative bond from the other side. So, so there are two isomeric complexes, ions with the formula this thing. Uh, one is green and the other one is violet. Suggests the type of isomerism shown by these two complexes. So over here, there are, there are a total of uh, six uh six ligands attached to it so chromium it's going to be an octahedral complex uh it's going to look like this it's going to be chromium uh these are all the all the data bonds would be on all these uh six axes x y and z axis so chromium would look like this uh so there's four ns3s now the four ns3s Could be situated uh, in one plane. While the what is the other other ligand? That's Cl minus one. So the Cl minus one ligand. Uh, that they could be one eighty degrees apart. So that's that's your trans complex. So that's uh, one of the complexes. That's your trans version. And then there's going to be another version, which is uh, so. Remember, whenever you have six six uh, ligands, it's going to be an octahedral complex. The other version would be, again, octahedral. These are the, so these are the six axis. So the other version would be that the CL lines would be making an angle of 90 degrees to each other. So instead of being opposite to each other, uh, the CL lines are right next to each other. So the NS3s are, So all these NH3s and their and the and their lone pairs are situated over here. That's your that's your cis. This one is your is your trans. That this other one is your cis. So explain why these complex ions are colored and why they have different colors. Uh, so you have to explain the whole colored thing. What happens is that when these lone pairs they approach, I'll open the notes for this as well. Uh, one second. And this is for
I said on this one, uh, transition metals. I said this one, colored compounds. What happens is uh, whenever you have ligands approaching, uh, the D subshell, which is inside the atom, it uh, all five D orbitals were identical, but now they'll split into two gaps. Green ones, it's harder to keep electrons. Uh, the pink ones in an octahedral complex, the electrons that are residing between the axes, it's easier to keep electrons over there. So your D subshell, which was earlier at the same energy level, identical, the electrons could have been anywhere in those orbitals distributed uh, uh, in an equal manner, uh, would now have an area where electrons are easier to keep. That's your uh, electrons between the axes, 3D, XY, 3D, XZ, 3D, YZ. And then there are electrons on the axis. It's harder to keep electrons in these green orbitals over here. So the electrons uh, would be, there would be an energy gap. And uh, a particular frequency from the visible spectrum, an electron from the lower energy would jump and move to the higher energy. So you have to, I mean, this is the explanation. Due to repulsion from lone pairs on ligands, the D subshell splits into two energy levels, electrons from lower energy. D orbital gains energy and moves to the high energy D orbital. Energy gap delta E matches frequencies which are part of the visible spectrum, hence a complementary color is seen. And uh, the other one is, why does change of ligands changes colors? Different ligands and the arrangements exerts a different amount of repulsion, which creates a different energy gap uh, as the D subshell splits. Since the energy gap is different, E is equal to HF, a different frequency is absorbed from the visible spectrum, which is why uh, you see a different complementary color. So that's that basically sums up. These are, these are two uh, questions that are always always asked, why are they colored and why does the color differ if you have different ligands or if the ligands are arranged in a different manner. So that is all that's four marks over here. You have to write that. Uh, let me open the MS for this one second. I said, but is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As I just want to compare it with the latest marking scheme. So for November, uh, that's 2016, 2022. And this was question number six. Let me rotate this. That's a question number. That's not question number six. This one. Four marks. D orbital spread into two energy levels. Absorption of light uh, from visible region. Electron promoted excited from a lower energy to the higher energy. And the, the energy gap is different for the two complexes. Uh, so these were the four marks. That's how the marks were distributed. Now, the next part is the ligand. One to die minor ethane is uh, represented by uh, EN. Uh, it's a this one remember is an is an example of a bidentate ligand. So there are three ions, and it says that it's already surrounded by six nitrogen atoms. Draw the three dimensional diagram to show the stereoisomerism of uh, of this molecule. So I'm going to refer to the notes as well, again that en bidentate ligand. This one. This is, this is, uh, where's Ian, just a second. Anyways, that's that's an example of a bidentate ligand. Uh, and that's your Ian. Now in bidentate ligands, this is the exact example. You have to remember this example that uh, bidentate ligands, when they're arranged in this way, they would form uh, uh, two stereoisomers. Uh, they would be mirror images of each other. Uh, it's an octahedral complex, n lone pairs from one side, n lone pairs from the other side, they would basically end up datively bonding with each other. So you have to, I mean, I'll just draw one. So it's uh, it's uh, n h2 on one side and there is n h2 on the other side. And the two are connected together by CH2. It's it's di, diamine, ethane diamine. So there's 
there is two CH2s. So you're gonna you're gonna draw connect uh, another di uh, diamine on this side. So it's gonna be NH2, another NH2, and they would be connected together. They're basically one molecule, so they're connected together in this way. And then there is going to be one over here. So that's one of the examples, and the other one is going to be a mirrored version. So, so remember, optical isomerism only happens when you have bidentate ligands, and uh, that's the only way. Uh, and here's another example: you can have two bidentate, bidentate ligands. And there could be two seals on the other side. Even then, there's going to be optical isomerism in that case as well. Uh, but make sure the seals are not on opposite ends. They should be next to each other. So moving on, uh, ethane one two dimer is a useful reagent in, in organic chemistry. Explain how the amino acid in one two amine allows the molecule to act as a brosted lowry base. So, so how how can it act as a base? Because why can it act as a base? Anyone can okay, issue. Sure. What's what's the issue with this? Why can it act as a base? Due to the lone pair of amine. Okay, so so the lone pair. Okay, so so you've got lone pairs, mm. and and the lone pairs uh except H plus one ions, and datively. The H plus one datively bonds with the lone pairs on end. That's what you're going to write. Uh, so that's it. I mean, how are they describing this? This is described as uh, as that nitrogen has a lone pair and it accepts a proton. That's it. So, so this is the description. Write an equation for the reaction with hydrochloric acid. So, so you got CH two, CH two. And you got NH2. So hydrochloric acid is going to provide two H plus one ions. So one N over here and one N over here. Both of them have lone pairs, so they're going to accept H plus one ions. So the product that's going to be formed is going to be uh, NH3 plus one on one side, CH2. And the other one would also be NH3 plus one. And you could put the Cl minus one. Cl minus one is expected, right? So, so uh, it's not doing anything. It was Cl minus one. It's still Cl minus one. So, so you'll just write Cl minus one next to it. That's your salt that's produced. Under conditions, di uh, amine reacts with ethane diuric acid to form a polymer. Draw the structure of the polymer Z. So, how is an amide linkage formed? That an amine, and you're supposed to draw one repeat unit. Ends up forming a dicarboxylic acid. So there's a there's a dicarboxylic acid, which is cedal bond O, and it's uh, OH. The other side is cedal bond O, and OH. So the OH and H are lost. So they get removed from the middle, and they would link up. And that's basically your amide link. But the linkages will continue. So the OH at this end would also be removed. Uh, the H from this end would also be removed. Uh, I mean, the molecule will continue from this side. So you'll put N, and that's your that's your uh, that's your polyamide. Name the type of reaction that is condensation or uh, elimination would also work. But it's it's condensation. A water molecule is produced as a as a result. I'll just check that. Okay, are they accepting condensation? Where's the where's the question? Uh, I mean that's that's what we drew. And uh, how many repeat units did he? I see. This is talking about condensation, not not elimination. Um, draw the showing. I says so. They wanted to show two repeat units. Uh, we just do one of them. So I mean, you just extend it. Just repeat it again. 
and that would be two repeat units. This is just one repeat unit. So make sure you draw another one, which will just be a continuation of the same thing. Uh, sketch the shape of a 3D XY orbital. So the 3D XY orbital is that the electron density would be lying between the X and Y axis. Uh, so where's the X and Y axis? So the electron density would be, would be between the X and Y axis. Some transition elements in the compounds behave as catalyst. Explain why transition elements behave as catalyst. Now, the reason why the very good, uh, uh, the very good catalyst is because they can gain and lose electrons both. Uh, now over here, you, you have examples of homogeneous and heterogeneous. They can do adsorption, they can do deadsorption. Uh, Fe, for example, ions can, can gain electrons and they can also lose electrons, unlike other metals. So that is the, so what, what are they giving for this? It's a, uh, It's the same thing. Elements have more than one stable oxidation state. Uh, that is the reason they can they can kind of gain electrons. They can lose electrons. So that is described in this way. That you have you have variable oxidation states, and this has actually never been asked before. So it's better to note this down. I mean, we know that why are they got catalysts because because they can do both things. Unlike, unlike group one metals, they always lose electrons. Uh, but transition metals can actually do both things. They can lose electrons and they can gain those electrons back again. And the other mark over here was for, uh, they can form data bonds with ligands or vacant orbitals that are energetically accessible. Uh, that's, that's another because they can form more bonds. Like in adsorption, what happens is, or you can write about vacant. I mean, basically justifies the variable oxidation state. Why do they have variable oxidation state? Because they have energetically accessible D subshell. What, what they mean by that is, that if you look at Fe's electronic configuration, uh, the end, like starting with 3s2, 3p6, then you have 3d6 and then 4s2. So electrons are not only lost from the 4s, the 4s and the 3d have very little energy difference. So if electrons are lost from the 4s, they can also be lost from the 3d as well, which is why they do have variable oxidation state in that uh, to begin with. Why can't calcium have variable oxidation state or sodium have variable oxidation state? The problem with sodium would be that uh, if you write its electronic configuration, there's a huge energy gap between the 3s and the 2p. So if you remove an electron from the outer shell, it's really hard to remove electrons from the 2p. But in the case of iron, the reason why they have variable oxidation states is that if you remove electrons from the 4s, you can also remove electrons from the from the 3D as well, because the energy difference is very, very less. I said, but anyways, it's better to note this down because they never actually asked this question before. So uh, why are they good catalysts? I told you because they can lose and gain electrons. Both things can happen. Uh, the way they described it is because they have variable oxidation states. And why do they have variable oxidation state? They went on to describe that, that the reason they have variable oxidation states is uh, that the D subshell is energetically accessible. It's not, it's not very hard to remove electrons from the D as well. So is this clear? Yes or no, is this clear? Yes, Okay, uh, so the next thing is, what's the next one? Uh, these are examples, Fe in the Haber process, that's heterogeneous, Fe ions in, uh, that's homogeneous, NO2, uh, that's uh, homogeneous as well. Uh, homogeneous is, were they in the same phase? Uh, 
heterogeneous they're in uh, in different phases so uh and this example has to be specifically i mean you need to you need to remember this example specifically for fe i mean all of them actually uh adsorption and deadsorption is the process i mean it's given in the notes over here as well okay if you go and look at the part where you have uh Right at the beginning, we described how catalysts work. So they're good catalysts. So the first part is they can work as, uh, I mean, they can work as, I mean, that's the part. So the first part is they can work as heterogeneous catalysts, like in the Hibber process, uh, the iron, uh, it's got this tendency to attract electrons. So what it does is it's got a lot of protons. So it's got this attraction for electrons. It doesn't really like to lose electrons. Instead, it has this, slight attraction for electrons. So the triple bonded electrons over here, they get attracted, pulled towards the iron when the molecule comes close to it and weak bonds are formed. That's adsorption. In this way, the triple bond, the very strong triple bond between them, that breaks. And uh, you've got these weak bonds. And the next step, you've got uh, uh, even those weak bonds, they basically break. Uh, iron lets go of those electrons because iron doesn't really like to gain electrons. It just weakly attracts electrons. So that bond between them breaks and uh, the, moly the atoms are now free to make new bonds. So adsorption and deadsorption. Weak bonds are formed between the catalyst and the reactant molecules, which weakens the old bonds. And then deadsorption, that those weak bonds which were formed uh, between the catalyst and the reactants, they break and now new bonds are formed. And then you had other examples of heterogeneous catalysts like the catalytic converter. Then you had examples of homogeneous catalyst, which was uh, the one that they're describing, the SO2-NO2 reaction. Uh, even in the catalytic converter, you had platinum or palladium or rhodium as a catalyst. Uh, so gases, these were solids. And there was one example of homogeneous catalyst, which was linked with uh, electrochemistry where you had. I think in America, so I did it. No, that's, that's homogeneous as well, right? I said, there's one example which you have to remember, and this one specifically, you have to memorize this one. That iodine and uh, this S2-8, they react. They have a very feasible reaction. Uh, if you would take out the potential difference, it comes out to be really positive. It's a very theoretically feasible reaction, but practically no reaction happens because both ions are negatively charged. So what you instead do is, you realize that iodine is not going to react with this one because both of them are negatively charged ions which repel each other. So they're never going to collide with each other. They're not, they're not going to attract each other. So you, you add in a bunch of iron ions. When you add iron ions, what happens is that the iron ions react with iodine and they also react with S2-8. With S2-8, they convert it into SO4. With the I minus one, they convert it, convert it into I2. Uh, the higher potential gains electrons, the lower one loses electrons. When an iron comes in contact with the sulfur ions, the higher potential gains electrons, the lower potential loses electrons. You get these two results. And iron remains unchanged. You start with Fe3+, plus, turns into Fe2+, plus, the Fe2+, plus turns back into Fe3+. Plus. So it remains unchanged, speeds up the reaction. So make sure you remember this specific example. They didn't ask, it's just a one mark question over here, but they might ask you about details about this reaction. As a moving on electrochemistry, I so said, this is, now you don't have a data booklet, especially this paper. This is the only paper that you have. This is how your papers are going to come. The table would be given for you. So you don't have to search for equations in the data booklet. They'll be right in front of you, which makes things, which makes life very easy. So E0 data from the table can be used to predict the reaction that takes place when the two solutions are mixed. Write an equation. So he's saying Fe2+, plus, SN2+, plus, SN4+, plus, is mixed with Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. So this one has a higher potential and the SN2 plus SN4 one has a, has a lower potential. So lower potential loses electrons, the higher potential ends up, ends up gaining electrons. So write an equation for the reaction. Uh, this one has to be multiplied by two as well because you need to balance the number of electrons gained and lost. So it's going to be SN2 plus plus two. And the product is going to be, what's the product over here? It's SN4 plus, uh, plus two. 
Fe2 plus. Calculate the E0 cell of the reaction. It's going to be reduction potential or higher potential minus the lower potential. So it's 0 0.77 minus 0 0.15, which gives you point, I think it gives you 0 0.62. Uh, then you have a stability question, a stability, case stability uh, values are given and the following two experiments are carried out. And uh, a few drops of, now this one looks difficult, a few drops of KSCN, which obviously contains the SCN minus one ligand. Uh, it's given away as CN minus one. Actually, they wrote it over here as well. So is added to Fe3 plus followed by a few drops of KF. So you add SCN minus one followed by F minus one. And in experiment two, a few drops of KF are added to Fe3 plus followed by, so in this one, F minus one is added first and then SCN minus one is added. So predict and explain the diff sequence of color changes you would observe in this reaction. So first thing is, which one of the two complexes is more stable? I mean, which one is more likely to be produced? Like if you add F minus one, SCN minus one, which one, which ligand exchange was, is more likely to happen? Based on the case stability value. You add F minus one, you add, add S, let's say you add both of them together. So which of the two complexes is going to form? Will F substitute the water molecules or will SCN minus one substitute? I said the above one, this one. K stability higher means uh, there's going to be more products because this is KC, KC is product. So, so this is more stable. This is more likely to be I mean, this is more stable, the first one, F minus one. Remember, a higher case stability value means uh, the chances of that ligand getting formed is much higher. So in the first experiment, you added SCN minus one. Now, if you added SCN minus one, this is going to be formed. I mean, this one, it's a... Uh, so you add SCN minus one. So obviously the first one cannot be formed uh, because you don't have F minus one. In the first uh, few drops of KCN are added. So you're going to get this. So you're going to get, you're going to get Fe, Fe with the five water molecules and one of the water molecules will get substituted by SCN minus one. And the whole thing has a charge of two plus and it's got a color off. It's got a deep red color. And then you add F minus one. Now, F minus one ligand exchange is more likely to be to happen. There's, there's, it's going to be more stable. So what will then happen is that this SCN minus one will quickly get knocked out because the ligand with F is, the complex with F ligand is way more stable. It's a, it's a lot more stable. So, so as soon as you add F minus one to it, the SCN gets knocked out and it gets replaced by F. And the whole thing has a charge of two plus and that's colorless. So that is what is going to happen. But in the next one, if you add F minus one first, what you'll get is this one. Five water molecules, F is formed two plus and you get a colorless solution. I mean, they told us it's colorless. And after that, in the, in the second experiment, you then add SCN minus one, nothing would happen there's not going to be any reaction. Because remember, based on the two complexes, the first one is more stable. So the SCN getting knocked out or getting replaced by F is more feasible. It's, it's going to happen because there's a lot bigger case stability value. The other way around, it's not going to happen. Like if F uh, binds with the iron, it will not get substituted by SCN because it's a, it's a lot unstable. It's, it's, it's got a lower probability of getting formed. So that would not happen. There's not going to be any reaction in this case. Is this clear? It's two more question. How did they describe this one? That uh, deep red, then colorless. And violet, which stays color, does not change. So that's exactly what we stated. And the explanation for that was uh, 
one mark for uh, three marks for observations. And you had to talk about the case stability value that uh, this one was way more stable compared to the other one. So just remember what do what does case stability? I mean, it was done right at the end over here in the notes. So just remember that whenever you have a large case stability value, you get more product. Uh, product is more stable. Uh, name the type of reaction during uh, happening that's ligand exchange. One ligand taking over, replacing the other one. Okay, you've got to calculate the pH of this one uh, and use your work and show your working. So, so this is acting as an acid. It's basically HA. It's dissociating into an ion and H plus one is being released, right? So it's acting as an acid and it's producing an H plus one ion. So, so uh, what's the expression for K? It's uh, H plus one squared divided by the acid concentration. So, so we have the K value, which is uh, 6.9 times 10 to the power minus four. H plus one ka nahi pata, you don't know what that is. That's that's unknown. You've got HA. HA is basically this thing. It's uh it's Fe3 plus. So you have the concentration of Fe3 plus, that's 0 0.25. So can somebody calculate what H plus one is? And if you want to find pH, it's going to be once you find H plus one, take the negative log of H plus one. So Try solving this. What do you get for this? Basga, Saim, can you try Munya? So we're getting three point. So we're getting three point seven six. I'll just check whether that's the correct one. Uh, no. That's, did you take under root? Like you have to, you have to under root this. I mean, this one, it's H plus one has to be under rooted. So it's not 3.76. So it's going to come out to be whatever they're saying. It's uh, what was the answer it was? 1.8. You can just make sure no silly mistakes. Anyways, moving on. Uh, organic question: There's ibuprofen and name the other name name the other functional groups apart from aryl benzene. Aryl is basically benzene with a carbon chain. So, so this one has a has a carboxylic acid. Uh, this one has an so that's I mean that's that's carboxylic. This one is is an amide and it's a phenol as well based on the OH over here. Uh, ibuprofen contains a and has to enantiomer state one similarity and one difference in the physical and chemical properties between the two enantiomers. So similar similarity is they have the same uh, melting point. Now the difference between chiral carbon atoms like enantiomers is that they rotate plane polarized monochromatic light in different directions. So let's see if that, I mean, that's it. The ability to rotate plane polarized light uh, in different directions. They're actually, they've given another one as well. So whenever you have two enantiomers, remember what are enantiomers? Enantiomers are optical isomers mirror images, molecules which are mirrored like your two hands uh, around the chiral carbon atom. So the difference is that uh, uh, they rotate plane polarized monochromatic light in different directions. One rotates it clockwise, the other one rotates it anti-clockwise. 
Um, I mean, that's the that's the difference. Plus, they're very important by bio biology. It's like uh, like your right hand is different from your left hand. Uh, biology is all about shapes. Biological molecules only work. Their functionality depends on active sites and their shapes. The lock and key model. It's uh, so so. If I mean your right hand will fit in into one. Uh, like if it, it's going to fit in, in your in the right glove, it can't. Your left hand can't fit in, into that glove because your fingers are pointing in different directions. What is made by a race mix mixture? That's a that's a mixture of enantiomers, basically, where you have both chiral carbon atoms. So it's a mixture of. So it's a mixture of enantiomers. That's what a race mix mixture is. And. Uh, and we have to equal amounts of each enantiomer. So equal amounts that has to be written. Mixture of enantiomers. I'll just add. I can't add actually. One second. So I'll just add equal amounts. And it's. As a polarized part, it, it doesn't, we will say equal, okay. Now the polarized part is, is nothing. It's like, uh, I mean, you don't have to go into a detail about this. All you have to do is you have to remember this, but I'll, I'll just explain, TK. no one is going to ask you. When you have one particular optical isomer, one particular version of an optical isomer, let's say this is uh, CL, you've got uh, CH3, and maybe you have C2H5 on this side. So this is a chiral molecule. Think of this as a solution. When you have light that's falling into it and it passes through it, the light uh, gets rotated. Its plane of polarization gets, gets rotated. What plane of polarization means? Plane of polarization of a wave. See, particles are all, always vibrating, right? So what you have always learned is that whenever you've seen a wave is, you've thought about particles vibrating up and down, right? They could also be vibrating sideways, like left to right. Do you get my point? So, so when you have light that's coming in, the particles can be vibrating in any direction. It's, it's a, I mean, this is one example. This is a good one. One second. Yep, this one. So, so what, what happens is the particles are not just moving up and down, they're also moving sideways. They're also moving at an angle of 30 degrees. Like, uh, uh, so they could be vibrating in, in all directions. Uh, so that's, that's an unpolarized or non-polarized wave. Uh, when you pass it through filters, like a polaroid, uh, like polaroid glasses, you have polaroid sunglasses. What happens is that only one particular direction of polarization passes through it, uh, not the other ones, TK. So that's a that's a plain polarized light, monochromatic light, this one. What it does is when when it when the light, a plain polarized light passes through a race make mixture or an enantiomer, its plane of polarization changes. So instead of actually vibrating uh, up and down the particles, they start vibrating, maybe sideways, left to right, or maybe at an angle. So is the is the idea clear? Something similar to this would happen. Like uh, previously, it was the red particles. The wave looked like the red particles, but now it's looking like the blue particles. The plane of polarization has changed. So you, you don't have to go into details about this. It's just that uh, the two enantiomers they're going to rotate the plane polarized monochromatic light in different directions. I say anyway. So you've got. Uh, so let's uh, let's. Continue with this in the next class then, TK. We'll continue next time. So, okay, everyone.